<laughs> we are on air, guys. Say hi. Hello. Hey. Hello, What's everybody. Up? This is so confusing. It's like everything's going back and forth. It's awesome. I feel like I'm in a spaceship. Redpixel at gmail.com. All righty. Was that a gunshot? <laughs> it could well be. I know. We're in America. We're in New York, so uh, it's possible. I don't know what else to do. It's crazy. I guess we're live right now, right? We're streaming. Nobody's watching us. We are. We are. We are live. Hello, everybody. I'm Kelly Slegel. I help manage the Adorama TV YouTube channel, and I'm going to speak very briefly and turn this over to the experts. Um, we'll have Rich Harrington joining us shortly, but right now we've got Gavin Hoey and Mark Wallace on the line, and maybe we should start by you guys introducing yourselves to the few people out there who don't know you. Um, Gavin, go ahead. I think he lost his audio. Gavin lost his audio. Let's have Mark I think so. start. All right. Hi, I'm Mark Wallace, and I am uh, one of the uh, contributors to Adorama TV. I'm a photographer out of Phoenix, Arizona, and I shoot mostly studio work, although I'm about to launch on a world tour for a few years. And so we're closing down the studios and about to travel around for at least two years, maybe three, something like that. So it's going to be fun. And there's Rich, I see. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a lot of fun. And I'm going to still be doing Adorama TV stuff, so just from different parts of the world. I think we're alive, guys, by the way. Yes, we are. I already introduced everybody cool. um, that have been here. So Rich, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the folks out there? Hi, uh, my name is Rich Harrington. I'm one of the folks who also does some Adorama TV content for you guys. So mostly in the video space, but I do love Lightroom that I'm also looking forward here to seeing what Mark has to say, and it looks like Gavin just temporarily disappeared, but he should be back in a second. Yeah, I hope Gavin comes back, because I think he's the star of the show, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, in the meantime, uh, us two <laughs> understudies will get started. Mark, you, do you mind going first? Sure. Well, the, um, the way that I use Lightroom is, you know, I, the, the thing I love about Lightroom is it's uh, totally customizable, so you can have a workflow that's unique to you, and so the way I use it, um, I almost always am in the studio, and then I'm doing uh, remote capturing, tethered capturing, and then uh, I'll capture to a small hard drive, something like this guy right here. I don't know if you can see it. I've um, got a little tether table that I use. And then uh, I'll actually build a catalog on this and then take this and put it on my main workstation and then import that catalog to, to uh, build it into our larger... Um, got an exploring photography uh, library just for Adorama TV... And then from that, I can do some retouching, and then there's a, uh, an export that goes to our editing bay, and so everything's formatted and ready to go for our Adorama TV video. So that's what we're doing mostly um, with Lightroom, but we also have a workflow that's specifically for uh, editing photos for commercial clients as well. So I think, is Gavin back? Gavin, no, are you Gavin there? Made it I am. I'm, I'm back at the moment. I don't know how long this will last. So. <laughs> well, let's let's jump to Gavin real quick so he can introduce himself to everybody. Just do a general introduction there, Gavin. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name's Gavin. For those that don't know me, I'm uh, from the, the UK. But at the moment, I'm here in New York, which is kind of a, a little bit weird. I know it doesn't look like New York behind me, but trust me, I'm in New York. And uh, we're doing some workshops here for Adorama, so it's, it's just fantastic. I'm, I'm having a, a real blast, and I'm not at all suffering with jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that sounded like sarcasm. I'm not sure. But I that think may have been a, a tiny bit. So, <laughs> yeah, it's 7 o'clock at night according to my laptop. So. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and I've got Mark, two more did you need to finish your thought? No, not really. I was just uh, trying to get the thing going. Um, one thing I, would, I do want to mention, people can ask questions live. And so there's, I, I can see that Judah and Ipalo and Flyer Forever 7, and there's all these other Mark Comans that are asking questions. And so if you want, there's a little button. I think it's on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can click it and ask us questions live. That's what we really want, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mark, you were talking about tethering. I'm a big fan of tethering as well. I do like that option in Lightroom to have images automatically come in as I'm shooting. It, it certainly gives you confidence, both because you have a screen that you can actually see things on, detail, critical focus, and because you can go in and make some tweaks. Now, Gavin, I'd be curious. Are you, uh, while shooting, do you try to 
think like a post processor at all? Are you always thinking, what can I do, or what am I going to do this image, or do you really split the two phases out in your work? No, I generally think about the post processing during the photography. So th there are things that your camera just can't do as much as we wish that they would. There's always going to be a, a point where you you just hit that wall that it just never going to work anymore, and you have to just say to yourself, well, sometimes. I'm going to have to lean on the photography to get this to work correctly. So I, I absolutely agree. In fact, Gavin, when I, I always am thinking of post-production when I'm shooting. And, and uh, one of the things I do in Lightroom is I'll build out presets for specific areas in the studio that I know I've, you know, either I'll desaturate or bump up the <coughs> contrast or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm tethering, I'll actually bring in and use a preset to sort of give a, a quick preview of the post that I'm going to be doing later. Um, and then in Lightroom, mainly what I do, because it's m mainly portraits, is I only do tonality corrections in Lightroom. I almost never do skin retouching or uh, pixel level editing. I know now in Lightroom 5 you can do that, but Lightroom, uh, I mainly just use it for tonality, color, white balance, contrast, um, sharpening, that type of stuff, because it does that so well so quickly. And then I'll just apply that to my set and then choose the winners and throw that over to uh, Photoshop for final retouching. Well, Gavin, do you mind kicking us off and showing us a, a trick or two in Lightroom, and then maybe Mark and I can do the same thing. We'll bounce around and each show off a few things. That could be interesting. I've never actually um, done a live uh, Lightroom thing on Google before. So, Mark, can I suggest you, uh, whilst I figure out how on earth that actually works on my computer, because we're having technical gremlins here, uh, perhaps I can throw that over to Mark or Rich first. So, because I'm just... Do you want to go first, Mark, or...? Yeah, yeah sure, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to share my uh, Lightroom. And make sure you share the whole desktop, otherwise Lightroom gets a little cranky with Google. Oh, does it? Oh, okay. Yeah, share Let the me, whole uh... desktop, otherwise it's like, oh, and it just shows, like, your histogram for some reason. It's kind of weird. Oh, okay. Uh, open system preferences. Oh, awesome, I love it. This. I will go in and reshare that. Screen share, desktop. That's a presenter's worst nightmare to <laughs> share your entire desktop. Are you kidding? Yeah, I know. Okay. All Did the secret that? things we've hidden. I know. <laughs> Clear yeah, my I, I, I see. I see your library view right now. Is that what? Okay. So let me show you. This is a, an actual photo shoot I did, and I have in Lightroom here. Um, this is a, a Lightroom catalog that I created to do Lightroom workshops, actually. And look who it is. Can you guys see that? <laughs> that's, uh, when Gavin and I were hanging out in uh, London. It was hey, that's a good was, shot. <laughs> that was such a fun day. I uh, wish we could tell all the fun things we did. Okay, so anyway, um, this was a, a, a shoot that I did for Adorama TV, and I think this was using constant lights in the studio. So uh, I was trying to show how you can use um, a 1.2 aperture. And so when we shot this, and a lot of times when we're shooting specifically for Adorama TV. We shoot a lot of stuff, but we only edit. Um, so you can see just a, a small chunk of that. And the, I think the final image was, uh, I think it was this. This was our final image that we shot. And you can see it's tack sharp and all of that. So the process when I was shooting this in Lightroom was I wanted to make sure primarily that uh, we were getting sharp images because with a 1.2 lens, any movement at all, and you're going to have things that are going to fall out of focus. And also, um, I wanted to sweeten these images up because we have a lot of red in these images. And so I'll show you some before and after work and show you sort of what I did to, to create these images. So the first thing we did, and I'm going to kick these side panels out, we just started shooting. This is a model. Her name is Casey. And you can see these are a little dark. Um, it's just not a very compelling image. And so we're getting sort of the feel of what this is going to look like. And um, I'm seeing where the light shaper, where the light fall off is. One of the things that I discovered was this just didn't have much, um, didn't have much flavor to it. And so I was shooting, looking at these images. You can see that this one is horribly out of focus. That's what you get with a 1.2 image. Um, but there just wasn't a lot of life to these images. We were seeing that we were having uh, problems with um, focus issues. And so as we were zipping through, um, what I decided to do is a brighten everything up because uh, the metering was off in the camera. And I think in this one, see if I can show you the, the information here in the develop module. I think in this one, we actually kicked up the exposure a little bit. Um, see, my laptop can keep up here. 
Yeah, you can see that as I was shooting, I discovered that we had a problem with exposure here. So I actually kicked this exposure up by a full stop in Lightroom. And when you're shooting raw, you can get away with that kind of stuff. And so um, we were sort of discovering what we needed to do to, to make this a, a better image. So you can see this one here, totally flat, that's punchy. So I want to show you some of the things that we did. Also, uh, I discovered that if we added a little lens flare, so we actually shot... Uh, lens flare always makes things better. Oh, yeah. So we actually got a light, and we shot it right into the lens to try to get some, some more effects. And you can see, look at the difference between these two images here. So we have... See if I can show those side by side. The one on the left, the one on the right. Now, these were shot... Uh, within a couple seconds of each other. So what happened to this image to make it so much more contrasty as opposed to this image? So let's go in and take a look at the adjustments that were made on this image and you can sort of see what Lightroom really helps you do. So if you can sort of understand what Lightroom's going to do to an image like this one that I'm showing, you can shoot that with confidence knowing that with some adjustments you can make it look like this. And so let's just take a peek at, at what happened here. So what I'll do here is I'm going to and one of my favorite little um, tricks in Lightroom is you can sort of um, set a snapshot. In other words, hey, save everything that's on this image right here so I can always go back to it if I mess it up. And so what I'll do here is I'm going to make a snapshot on the left-hand side here. It's going to ask me what the snapshot name is. And I'm just going to name this um, Adorama Demo uh, before. So I'll create that. That's done. And then what I can do is I can go down here and I'm going to reset the image. So this is this reset button. Whoops. Sorry about that. I'm going to reset this. And by resetting it, you can see what it looked like out of the camera. So there you have it. This is out of the camera. It's very flat, low contrast, um, doesn't have a lot of color to it. And so what we did to this, and to show you exactly what I did, I'm going to go into the history over here on the left, and I'm going to step through this one by one so you can see exactly what happened. So the very first thing that I normally do with something like this is I want my black levels to be absolutely black. So you can see up here on the histogram, the blacks aren't black. They're just a, a dark gray. So I want those to be absolutely black. And so what I did was I actually went in there and adjusted those blacks. And you can see I actually pulled this in by a little more than two-thirds of a stop. So I adjusted those blacks so that that immediately gives us contrast. And I'll just do this manually really fast here. So you can see how that really gives you contrast almost immediately. And I'm using my histogram to sort of guide the way here. So the next thing that I did here, oh, did I just get rid of all of my, I did. So let me, yeah, go back there. So the other thing, and since I just got rid of my history accidentally, that's always fun. I can't walk through it. It's a um, learning moment. Yeah, it's like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I should have just clicked right through there instead of going through. So the other thing that we did here is um, we also adjusted this exposure. And you can see this exposure was up by about a quarter stop. So when I brought in those blacks, that's going to adjust um, how the overall image looks like. So I did that. And then almost always when I adjust blacks, let me just reset this one more time here. When I reset my black, what happens is you start losing midtones here in, or in the shadows, the dark shadow details. So I almost always do this little opposite thing. I'll pull my blacks down and I'll bring my shadows up. So it's an almost always an opposite thing. And so you can sort of see in this area here, I don't know if this will show up in the Google Hangout, but we're losing and gaining shadow uh, detail. Um, and so we were able to do that as well. And then the last really major thing that I did here is I clicked my, I just took the clarity way up. Yay! And so I know most people just <laughs> absolutely hate working with clarity on an image of a person, but sometimes it's the thing that makes it the easiest thing to do. Because watch what happens when I take this clarity down. So what's happening is I am sharpening this and I'm adding contrast all at the same time. And that really pulls out um, the details in that image. And then I think the last big thing I did, because there's so much orange in this, is I took the saturation of that orange way up to give it that really awesome tone. And you can see by sliding this orange around that there's just a ton in there. Anyway, that's, you know, I could spend all day going over this image, but you can see that the before and after of this image is pretty, 
pretty stark, and it, it wasn't a lot of things. So we set the black, we changed the exposure a little bit, um, did a little bit of um, clarity, and then one little slider of orange, and we got to the final image there. Very nice. Very nice. Um, mind if I jump in and show one? Yeah. Far, jump right. in and show, absolutely. I'm going to shut down my screen sharing. All right. And Gavin, are you good to go next? Uh, I am. I haven't figured out how to share my screen yet, but I'm... Okay. There's a, <laughs> there a button should up be a... there on the left. Yeah. Got yeah. the second button down. Oh, chat. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> see, it's, 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 if you're going to make it complicated. Now, are you guys seeing alligators on your screen? Am I successfully yeah. sharing the alligators? Okay, cool. So uh, I use Lightroom, of course, for photos, but a lot of folks don't realize that you can actually do some video processing in Lightroom. So, you know, here's a video clip. Uh, not a high motion clip, but, you know, you see the butterflies floating around there, flittering on top of that sleeping alligator. And you can use everything within the quick develop. So if something feels wrong with the white balance or you want to dial that in, you can do so. You know, so I can warm or cool a shot, maybe for artistic jumps or just a subtle shift there using the minor adjustment. I can introduce some toning in there and pull down the exposure to recover the shot. I can add some vibrance to pop the color. Now, of course, any of the presets you have in here can also be chosen, and that's cool and all, because you know, I can go in here and say, oh, give me the, the cross-process look. Now, it tells you that certain effects can't be applied to the video, but it will do the generic look. But what's kind of cool is you can actually kind of cheat. So if you're back in your library view and you select this, you can actually take the image, and if you make a still or you adjust a photo, what you can then do is make your own preset and then sync that back. So here I got a video clip, and I've made one of my own user presets, and I can apply that. And so anything that you can do to a photo, you could save as a custom preset and then sync it back to a video clip with minor exceptions. Some of the things like vignette controls, split toning, a couple of those things can't be synced, but it does a pretty good job, and it applies that look to the clip, and then, of course, you could tweak. So if I wanted to pull that down a little bit, I could. If I wanted to just shift that to put different emphasis into some of the color channels for the black and white conversion, I have it. And then when I export that video out, you can actually make a movie and what you have the choice to do is include in the movie export, it will apply that. So I can make the video file, save that out as a new file, and then apply maximum quality. So it'll pull that out at a very similar data rate, exact same size and everything else, and makes a new video file that I can use in another tool like Photoshop or Premiere Pro and work with it. So a lot of folks find this a fun way to organize their content and you know, you can do things like fix the white balance. So, you know, here it's just a little off. I could compensate for this, you know, getting it back so we're a little bit cooler there. And let's take that, cool that down just a little. Pop the vibrance so we get a richer sky. And open up the exposure just a bit. And you see that all of that was applied to a full motion video clip right there in Lightroom. So if you are using video sparingly, I would consider importing it along with your stills, and you can make some basic adjustments here before you hand the video off to the next person in line. That's me. I'll do something That's else. That's cool. That's really good. Hey, All Gavin, right. we have a bunch of uh, questions. Do you want to go through and answer some of these questions yeah, uh, people are asking? You follow the questions. I haven't found <laughs> I'm, All right. such a, I'm such a newbie at this. I haven't found any of these things yet. <laughs> Hang on. Is there a chat box? Or, no. Yeah. It says Q&A. <laughs> It's in American English, though. It might not translate to uh, Queen's okay. English. Oh, no, apparently I have to download a new app for that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> you know we're going to make fun of you forever for this. This is going to be awesome. Uh, um, so, yeah, so one of the things people said is uh, when you're using Lightroom, do you import the camera raw files or do you convert them to DNG files? That's a, that's a great question. I always leave them as the standard camera raw. I, 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 I don't normally convert to DNG just to bring them into Lightroom. Uh, if I'm going to share them with anybody, then I convert them to DNG because you can share them with people who haven't got the, the latest version of Lightroom or Photoshop or Elements, but you're shooting with a new camera. So, so that kind of makes sense. So that's the only time I convert to DNG personally. I don't know about you guys. 
I, I found a cool little workaround with DNG that I sometimes like. So uh, one of the things that I'll sometimes do is if I need to give the file to somebody, I can make any basic adjustments that I want and then resave it as a DNG. So I'm giving a raw file to the client, but if I wanted to make any tweaks, I could make those tweaks before they see it. So it's sort of my version of the raw, and I could even build in some different snapshots of suggestions as to what I want them to do with the file, but they can then, of course, still have all the raw flexibility. Yeah, I, I always stick with the proprietary raw files because I find them to be a lot more robust and easy to use. Uh, um, and I never share raw files with clients. It's crazy to me. <laughs> I mean, one day I'm sure I will, but I mean... If somebody gave you enough money, you would share one, Mark. Yeah. yeah. I have yeah. a million dollars. <laughs> Art, uh, you know, retouching services and stuff I have, but generally never. It's crazy. Lunacy. Um, all right, resharpening and noise reduction. Is, the best, is this best done in Lightroom 5 or in Photoshop CC? Sharpening and noise reduction. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same. Yeah, it's the same same difference. I, I prefer sharpening in, in Lightroom um, because it's so easy. If you can just say sharpen for screen or sharpen for print, and it's pretty, pretty accurate. The only time I sharpen in, in uh, Photoshop is if I'm doing sharpening specific to an actual print size. So if I'm doing a, a extra large, like a four by five foot image or something that needs some really, um, like, you know, bicubic whatever enlarging to make sure that it's all perfect, then I'll do all that in in Photoshop. But in in Lightroom, I just uh, all my video work, all that kind of stuff. It's so fast. Well, sometimes if I'm using uh, Photoshop because I've been compositing, you can group everything into a smart object, and then once it's a smart object apply camera raw as a filter and then you've got the right. exact same sharpening that you have in Lightroom and so maybe you've got multiple layers or you've done some really complex masking you could then still use sharpening and I personally prefer to sharpen when I consider the image finished so yeah. if it was finished yeah. in Photoshop I would sharpen there if it was finished in Lightroom I would sharpen there and mm -hmm. I, I think you guys agree if you can finish in Lightroom great finish in Lightroom it's that much faster otherwise oh, yeah. sharpen when you're done Mm -hmm. I always agree that you, you have to sharpen at the, the output size. So if you sharpen for a, a print that's um, you know, 300 dpi, 4 foot wide, that sharpening is going to look horrible for a web image, and the, the opposite is true. So you always have to get the image to the correct size and then sharpen last. And that's why I love sharpening in Lightroom, because it sharpens on export, and so it always does it last. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although, if you if you want to add to that as well, you don't have to sharpen the whole picture, and and that's right. often something we make a bit of mistake. And that's perhaps sometimes where Lightroom can be a bit tricky because it wants to do everything. So often, if I've got a picture where I've got a, a defocused background, I'll bring it into Photoshop so I can sharpen with the sharpen brush. Which, since Photoshop CS5, it has been just a fantastic way just to put a little bit of sharpening just here and just there rather than just sort of sharpening absolutely everything. So yeah. uh, I often find that to be a, a nice little finishing touch just in local areas. Yeah, I also use um, uh, high-pass filters, a trick I stole from Joel Grimes uh, for sharpening highlight areas. And it's um, actually have a course on that that you can download from Mark Wallace Life. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, um, I find that for especially... Um, that really high key look where you have highlights on uh, jawlines and stuff, you want that sort of shiny look, it works so well. Um, so it's not sharpening, but it's, it's a technique. Mm. All right, we got tons of questions. Let me ask you this one. What's the best tools for um, post-production? A graphic table? Is it really useful? So do you use a Wacom tablet, I guess is the question. Uh, I'll answer that one because I think Rich has disappeared. Uh, no, there we are. That's a quick answer, isn't it? I use a mouse. And I've, I've tried. I've tried to use a graphics tablet. I really, really have. And I have to say, I, I tried the. I think it was the Intuos Five, and that was pretty good. That that for me worked quite well. But um, I don't know. The sort so, of work I do yeah. doesn't necessarily require the the the, the features of a uh, a graphics tablet as much as just a a mouse. But maybe that's more my style of imaging than than anything else. <laughs> maybe so. I, I found it when I switched to the. The Wacom tablets, my post-production, specifically for uh, skin retouching and you know um, portrait work, it it probably saved me uh, for every hour I worked. It probably saved me for an, an hour. So my post-production probably went down by fifty to sixty percent, um, and the accuracy and all the different things. So now I'm I'm the opposite of you. I'm like you can 
pry my Wacom tablet from my <laughs> cold, dead hands. Don't take it from me. I live and die with it, so yeah. It, did, it does take some getting used to, but I like mine. Let me answer yeah. one quick question that popped up in the pod, and then, Gavin, maybe you can show us a, one of your favorite techniques, and then we'll do mm -hmm. another round robin. Um, Alan is concerned about Lightroom being expensive. I just want to... There's a lot of misperceptions about price, so I just want to take 20 seconds to sort of lay out your options. Option one is $10 a month, you get Lightroom and Photoshop and 20 gigs of backup, and so that's viable for a lot of folks who don't prefer to buy. Option two is buy it in a box, and I regularly see that go on special for as low as $79. I believe list is $149. There's upgrade pricing. Um, in any case, you're looking at a commitment of about 10 bucks a month on average for the user, so I, I think there's a lot of easier ways to find $10 in your life per month, so that's my take. Mark, you go looking for bones to find ten bucks. I like the I like the look. Yeah, I'm just trying to keep it, you know, entertaining. <laughs> yeah, it's all. it's all good. Sorry to soapbox for a moment. You ready? Oh, there you go. That's that's a good yeah. one. So, yeah. Gavin, you ready to show something? Okay. Hopefully, hopefully, what you should get is my screen. Yeah, we yep. see it. Woo! Okay, good stuff. Okay, so um, you can see Lightroom. Uh, good. Okay, so just a, a couple little workflow tips because most people know that I, I do Photoshop predominantly. In fact, if I had to, to nail it down to number of pictures I process, I probably process more through Lightroom, but I spend more hours in Photoshop. That, that's just kind of the way I work. But that makes sense. I, I like Lightroom for its speed and its convenience, but there's things about Lightroom that I find uh, frustrating and, and can drive me sli slowly mental. One of them can be the, the library and the importing option. Uh, I'm, I'm one of these OCD people. I like to know what's going on. I like to be in total control. So I have my own library system that I like to use. So when it comes to, say, <coughs> importing, I want to import some pictures. And I've got to go through that whole process of finding where I've hidden my files. Um, they're, they're, on, they're on my hard drive somewhere. And, and my laptop I've got here hasn't got that many files on. You see my, my desktop at home. It's a real mess. But I know where everything is. So when you hit the import button, and you don't want to go through scrolling through your, your images. If you're on um, uh, Internet Explorer, like I am here uh, on Explorer, I can actually go through and find my pictures. But what, let's say I just want to bring in one, two, three, four. I want those four pictures that I know where they are on my hard drive, but I don't want to search through Lightroom to find them. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to select those four images, and I'm going to drag them down onto my Lightroom button on my taskbar, bearing in mind I'm on a Windows machine, and then I'm going to drop them here into the import box. For those who don't speak Windows, that would be the dock. The dock. And yeah, it works the same <laughs> way on a Mac. Mac. <laughs> of course, when you do it slowly, of course it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm going to slowly scream at my... Computer. <laughs> Clearly, when you're doing a Google Hangout, that doesn't work at all. But it'll bring up just the, the ones you want to bring in. There, there you go. If you see, if you swear and curse, you see, you can't see my face now, can you? No. Go ahead. Good. <laughs> <laughs> if it's going to go wrong, it'll go wrong live. But there you can see. So you can see what it's done is it's opened up the folder wherever it might be on my hard drive and it's only selected the same four images that I chose. So I, I've done my, my selection outside of Lightroom, but Lightroom's accepted it and it's brought it in. So when I import them, it'll only bring in those four files. So that, that's, for me, that's great, because it's almost, it's very nearly the same as file open. It's as close as file open as you're going to get in Lightroom. And uh, that's, that's what I'd love. I'd love file open. Please, Adobe. <laughs> well, Mark, Mark, you got one you want to show? Uh, I can, I can um, go on one more. I'll... Oh, go, go for it, Gavin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, yeah. Trust me, whilst you've still got an internet connection here, make the most of it, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, into develop. So I want to go and make some changes. Now, these are actually a little panorama sequence. So I chose these because we, we've just had the Olympics and uh, the, the previous Olympics, the Summer Games, were in London. And I, I just happened to have been there, which was kind of nice. And We actually had good weather. Look, this is London in the sun. <laughs> it's a rare thing. So this is a panorama, a multi-image panorama. Now, Lightroom can't stitch multi-image panoramas, but if you're on the, uh, the package, the, the photographer's package from Adobe, the CC package, you get Lightroom and Photoshop. So even though perhaps you're using Lightroom for most of your work, there are little things you can't do in Lightroom, such as 
stitching a panorama. So if I right click on any of my images, I can choose Edit In, and from here I can merge them as a panorama in Photoshop. So it'll grab my images from Lightroom and bring me not only into Photoshop, but straight into Photo Merge. Brilliant. So I can use the Auto option. If you're stitching together images, Auto works. Auto doesn't work. There's actually one time when Auto never works. That's when you're doing a Google Hangout for the first time. Then it doesn't work at all. <laughs> if it doesn't work, choose Cylindrical. Then it'll work just fine. Hit OK, and it'll gather the images together and just stitch them. So we've gone from Lightroom. We've gone into Photoshop, and we've said to Photoshop, make my panorama. And by the way, if you've got Elements as well, this would work brilliantly. And Elements, Lightroom, really good combination if you haven't gone down the, uh, the CC route. And it's just going to work your way through those little files. And there you go. There's my panorama. Okay, we'll just Sweet. crop that in. And then, of course, the lovely thing about Lightroom is you've come from Lightroom. So when you close that down and you save it, where do you end up? Lightroom. You end up back in Lightroom, and there's your panorama in Lightroom. Which is cool. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well okay. done. Brilliant. So uh, that, that kind of, uh, that's a nice little round-robin trip all the way through from importing to going through Photoshop and then back into Lightroom again. Awesome. Let me show a little trick here. I want to show one now. Um, let's see. I've got to do my entire screen, right? Yeah, my desktop. So this is, I th think, an underappreciated um, Lightroom trick. Well, there's a couple of them here. So uh, the first one I have is um, I have some... Um, Images that I shot actually when I was in London, hanging out with Gavin in Paris. I think there's all Paris except for this one. So um, I, wasn't, but if you, I wasn't in Paris. I didn't get this memo, guys. I'm, I'm feeling a little jealous. <laughs> Are you feeling left out? Sorry, um, Adorama didn't pay for it, so you have to sign your own bill. Um, so uh, these are shots from my iPhone, and you can see here that uh, these are JPEG images. So these all say JPEG images. So all I did was I took some iPhone shots and I dumped them into Lightroom. And normally I use iPhoto for managing all my iPhone images. Um, but here's a trick that I love. If you have uh, your um, location um, services on in your iPhone, in other words, you know, keep track of where you took a picture, when you bring it into Lightroom, Lightroom recognizes that. And you get this little pin right here. And so what we can do is we can go over to the map and this is really cool. When we zip over to map, this is going to go and connect to Google Maps, and it will now show me on a map exactly where each of these photos was taken. Let's see if I get my internet to work. Here it is. Phoenix, yes. So this, click this, and there it is. We can hey. actually see where in Paris all of these things were taken. And if I click on that, it'll actually show you the photos that were there. So if I had multiple photos in a location, this actually brings up a little slideshow here. So I didn't want to bring in all of my pictures from that. Or I can just go click on this here, and we can see, hey, that's where Gavin and I were hanging out. Yes. <laughs> right there. We and were so, in the River Thames, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, we were in the river. And so we were actually right there. You can see exactly where it was that we were. And I love that feature. Now there's uh, another thing that you can do um, if you have a GPS watch, and I didn't bring in my track, but there's a little, um, this little line down here, and it's this little squiggly right here, and there's an upcoming Adorama TV episode I'm going to do just about this, and it's called GPS Track Logs. So let's say you have like a Garmin Phoenix or any kind of GPS device. If you've synced the clock on your phone with the clock on your GPS device, what happens is it will... You can load a track log, so I don't have any here, but it's a, a GPS uh, path. And then what happens is you bring that into Lightroom, and it will match the time and date and second to the photos with the time and date and second, and you basically then get the benefit of a GPS on a, on a, a, phone, or a uh, camera that doesn't have GPS, and it'll say, oh, this was taken at 12 o'clock, and this is where you were at 12 o'clock. Oh, you were right here. It's really cool. So you can do GPS stuff on a non-GPS camera as long as you have some kind of GPS device. Very nice. Cool. Yeah. M mind if I show uh, how to drag sliders when you don't know which one to drag? Yeah, show us. Go for it. All right. Let me uh, switch over. Are you seeing uh, a mad scientist laboratory? 
Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's your bedroom. I uh, know. No. 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 This is uh, this is Disney Sea in Tokyo. This is the the only version of the Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea ride that still exists in the world. Oh. And uh, one of the things is I was shooting underexposed because I was handheld. So you know I pushed up against the glass, just fired off a shot because I wanted to get it, but I was underexposed because I didn't want to get a long exposure. I was getting jostled around, and there's a whole bunch of tools in Lightroom that you don't actually have to know really where to click or adjust. And one of the ones I like is the histogram. So you see as I mouse over the histogram, it's showing me blacks, shadows, exposure, highlights, and whites. Well, I could just grab right here and start to pull over. And you see that I just fixed the exposure interactively right within the histogram. And I could lift those shadows a little bit by dragging those over. And I could pop my whites by pulling those in a little bit. And you see how easy it is. Let's pull down the highlights just a little so they're not so bright. Right within the histogram, I get interactive feedback, and I can just basically pull the image where I want without having to go through all these other sliders, without dealing with the limitations of the, the, quick, uh, the quick mode over there in the library view. And then in the tone curve, if you take this guy, you can actually just click in the image itself, and I can say, oh, right here, make that area just a little darker. And let's pull this up just a little, and let's go in here and pull that down. And again, I didn't have to know where to click. So I just grabbed the shadows, exposures, highlights, etc. up here, and then used this on image tool, and I got in a pretty good place. Last thing to show was there was a question about clarity versus sharpening I saw in there. And, and the thing that I always say is to think about is that clarity and sharpening are really two different things. Clarity is essentially um, selective contrast, and vibrance is selective saturation, meaning that it, clarity puts contrast into the edges. And so negative goes soft, and this adds contrast. A lot of people think of that as sharpening, but it's really a whole different thing. And so vibrance adds selective into the skin tone sort of area. And notice here, by pulling the vibrance down, look at how the glass goes from having a color tint to looking a little bit clearer. And that was a pretty quick fix. And, and then, of course, you know, the image just is not done uh, until you go down to the finishing touches. And uh, everybody loves just a little bit of that. We'll call it good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you won me it. Put a vignette on it. You got to put a vignette on it. You got to put a vignette on it. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's not art unless there's a vignette. It's essential. It's yeah. ironic, isn't it? We we try and avoid vignettes with our cameras all the time, but yeah, we go and stick a vignette on every single picture now. It's, uh, I know. Absolutely. I was I was half I joking, it. although I think in this case it worked. But uh, I just I, love being able to just click and drag around here in the histogram and use that on image tool and the curves. It, it just really cuts down on bluntly having to know which slider to grab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lightroom 6, you can put a bird on it. You can get it for <laughs> All, right. All right, 10 people got that joke. You want to do more questions? Yeah, sure. go on. Let's see what we got. Uh, here's one. What's the perfect size for social media? My opinion is 1,200 pixels on the long edge. That's what no, I use. No, no, no. It depends on your social media. So if you're doing Facebook, which is where I put a lot of my kind of pictures, 960 pixels on the longest side. And even better... 960 pixels square, because Facebook shows square images a little bit differently, and you get to see 960 by 960. So if you're Facebooking, 960 is the magic number. I'm going to respectfully say no. It's 1,200 on the long side. No, <laughs> no, no not unless... <laughs> Come on, let's go. Not unless Facebook... Yeah, oh, God, gonna... <laughs> no, so, is, uh, so you're talking about to show up in the timeline perfectly. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so Facebook's kind of default yeah. size. If you, if you put an image on Facebook, it'll you click it, 960 is the size, longest edge that it'll show. I'm just biased. I, I use a, a sharing site that will just serve it up to match the user's screen, but that's me. But uh, Which I, one do you use? Uh, something I'm working on called Picture you can look at later, P-I-Q-S-U-R-E. Okay. So it'll serve up to whatever the user's screen is when you click on the picture. Mm -hmm. So, But, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it really depends on the service. You, you've nailed it. Is there another good question in there, Mark? Yeah, um, let's see. Would you guys recommend using a monitor calibration? Uh, so do you calibrate your screen? And if so, what tool do you use? Yeah. Uh, I, I do a couple of things. It depends on what I'm doing. 
Uh, if I'm calibrating for print, um, a lot of times I use a dream color display, which has calibration built in. But I, I've also used, uh, there's a whole slew of tools. I've used one from Pantone and Spider to, to calibrate, where you put it on the screen and it resets. I'm sure you guys have your favorite. Uh, it really just sort of depends. Or, you know, I'll get a profile from, um, you know, a printer profile, and I'll, I'll run with that. Yeah, I use the, the Color Monkey is what I'm using. That's nice, too. Um, mm. and it works just great. By the way, Gavin, I just checked, and you can see a 1,200-pixel-wide thing on Facebook. Oh, have they I changed like, it? Like, right. Not right. I well, know you. Gavin, ask yourself this: Did a week pass? Well, yeah, yeah maybe that's it. Maybe then they changed it. it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like I can't believe this whole time, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. Maybe maybe it's a US thing. Perhaps in the UK we're not allowed to have anything bigger than nine well, six. It's the metric to, to inches conversion. <laughs> they screwed up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I use a, uh, an old, yeah, spider thing that sticks on my screen. It is pretty old as well. I've, I've run it through a couple of PCs, but it, it's still pretty reliable. And at the time, I bought, a, it was really expensive. It was top of the line. And I think that's often a good idea. If, you, if you're buying into something now, buy something that's <coughs> going to last a little bit longer. But I was looking at a demo of the, the Color Monkey the other day. Yeah, I was tempted. Because uh, it, it, it could do the prints, it could do the screen, it could do a projector if you had time. Yeah, and, uh, I use it religiously, um, and of course I'm an X-Rite photo guy, but they, I, I love the Color Monkey, and they have the, the i1 display, i1 display pro, and all these new devices, um, and they actually teach me all that stuff, because in full disclosure, I'm a Colorado X-Rite person. Um, my personal opinion, the Color Monkey that's, um, that came out years ago is, is the best tool that I've, I've ever seen, and I had a spider as well, but the, I love the Color Monkey. Um, you can even do, you can take it and put it on a color, and you can get a, a, a spot color. So if you want to do, like, a, a design for a company logo, and they're like, we want it to be this green, and you don't know what that green is, you can go, boop, and it tells you the the RGB, CMYK, whatever color space you're in, it tells you the, the exact color of that. So it's, it's, it's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, Rich, is Lightroom only available on the cloud, or can you keep it as a standalone package? Can you buy it in a box? Yep, they still sell boxes. Um, Adobe classifies Lightroom as being both a professional and a consumer tool. Um, you know, they, they see it as basically the perfect photo tool for all photographers. So anything that they don't classify as 100% pro, they will continue to sell boxes and electronic downloads. So... Um, I don't know if you'll always be able to buy it in a box, but you'll always be able to buy a license that doesn't expire. And, I, well, always is a strong word, but I get to talk to Adobe a lot because of what I do, and uh, they've assured me that they've heard loud and clear and will continue to provide Lightroom that way. And they've started making inklings of other things, like you're seeing the Lightroom app and other stuff. So there's probably going to be stuff that only works for cloud features, like the Lightroom app is really designed for professionals to be taking their images on the go, but, you know, we'll see how that all shakes out. But I've been told that Lightroom is going to continue to be a tool, and without getting myself shot in a back alley somewhere, uh, there's <laughs> cool things that they're putting in. So it's not like they're sitting on their laurels. The Lightroom team is adding new stuff all the time. That's awesome. Um, and you can get the box from Adorama. You can order Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's yeah. worth, worth saying as I'm here in Adorama. Is, is they have a brilliant little store here. And yeah. You can get pretty much anything from them. When, whenever I visit them in New York, I always leave spending more money than I wanted because I just can't yeah. control. It's like, well, there's that. Oh, I wanted that lens. Yeah. There's that. I know. Yeah. yeah, I got a guided tour yesterday, and uh, it was just like my little dream heaven place to go That's and awesome. have a look around. and. Yeah, it was like, yeah, I've always wanted one of those, and I've always wanted one of those, but unfortunately I've only bought a small suitcase, so I can't, <laughs> I can't take them back. But. See, if you can go to the warehouse, it's awesome. You write a little segue around. It's really? Huge. It's oh. huge. Yeah. Oh. It's just like I'm shelves going. and shelves and shelves of, of stuff. All right, uh, Gavin and Richie, you guys probably, I, I don't have a good strategy for this, so what's the best way to back up a catalog that's already partially backed up? And I'm guessing that this person is, is talking about not at the end when you're closing down Lightroom. If you have it set up that way, it says, hey, we're going to back this up, and it automatically does a backup of the catalog. You mean all the I'm, images? I'm guessing, like, yeah, the images. Mm. Any strategies I, for that? I use two things that I like. One, I use Crash Plan, which um, is you can use, like, the free version of the app, and I just target another drive. And then I use a service called Mosaic, which backs up to the cloud, and they've got different levels, but I, I like to use that for archiving. And then... Um, for me, 
I just leave the images where they lie, but inside of Lightroom, you do have the ability to select a bunch of images in your library, and you can basically relocate those images. So if you've got them spread all over a bunch of different drives, you can pull them into sort of one central location. And so then every night, um, I use something called Carbon Copy Cloner. It looks at my main Lightroom drive, which in my case is like a 20 terabyte Drobo, and it mirrors to a second 20 terabyte Drobo, so everything gets backed up every night. So basically, I got three backups going, and they're all automatic. So once I set it up, I never had to do it again. I'm paranoid. <laughs> that, yeah. that is belt braces and a spare set of braces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good thing, but I'm not sure if I should be offended. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. No, I'm, I'm envious and jealous. <laughs> no, my backup system is a lot more low-tech than that. Oh, maybe I should maybe I should rethink it. It's so, a British bulldog. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, it's it's a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's just a. So I've got a um, uh, an external hard drive, but it's a, a four external hard drive mounted system. So it it kind of uh, mirrors my my hard drives inside of my PC, and I I back them up. But I'm not like you, Rich. I don't back up every single night. Well, I don't have to. I don't have to trigger it. I just schedule it. So every night it says what's different. And you, there's free programs that'll do that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I just switch yeah. my machine off. I'm more worried that if I leave it running, <laughs> it, it's actually more likely to go wrong. So I, I tend to back up after I've had uh, a fair number of pictures go on. So if I've just done a, an important, any time I've done anything for a client, goes without saying that gets backed up. So, but I, I'll back up maybe once a, a week, once a fortnight, depending on my shooting schedule, and uh, I'll, I'll choose when, how. And, and I make sure it happens. Again, it's my little more paranoid me. I want to see it doing. I want to click a button that says, yes, do it. And I want to see everything move across the screen. So, Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have all kinds of different systems. Our video systems, we use the Drobos. They're awesome because they automatically have, you know, it's like a RAID system that's uh, redundant. So if a hard drive fails, you can just pull it out, put a new one in. It's all set. Two of them fail, you can pull those out. And so, you know, the... Unless there's catastrophic failure, like a fire or something, Drobos are amazing. Yeah, you set uh, yours up so two of them can go down, right, Mark? Yeah, yeah, and they, um, they're ju and they're, they, they have pretty high capacity, but um, uh, we're shooting so much. Just my stills, um, I believe I have about 10 terabytes of, of storage just for my stills at this point, something like that. It might be 20. I don't know, I'll have to ask Matt, but it's a lot. It's, and I have just... Here's my um, today's hard drives that I'm carrying around. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'll shoot with one TSA of TSA loves me when I go through. I, I, I signed up for yeah. the TSA pre just so they no longer ask. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Um, more questions because we're almost out of time. Um, this one from Madi I think is really interesting. What's better, a standard develop for a full session or a one-to-one -one develop with different white balance selections? And I think they're, he's talking about, you know, you can have develop presets um, that are specific to white balance of and serial numbers of cameras. Do you use that capability at all? Uh, it, it exists, but I, I find that conditions change so much. I mean, I think if you were under, if your shooting conditions weren't changed and you were in a standard studio environment, maybe. But I don't know. I find there's too much variety for me. Yeah, I used it a little bit when I was shooting. You know, back in the early days of Adorama TV, I think I had. 25 different cameras, a lot of Nikons, a lot of Sonys, Canons, uh, Fuji, um, you name it. And in the studio, the characteristics of some of the the uh, entry-level models of cameras at higher ISO settings, you had massive noise that you didn't have, for example, at a, an entry-level Nikon at ISO 1600 or 3200 has lots of noise, whereas uh, a D3S or D4 you could shoot at 12,800 ISO and your noise is, is really minimal. So I wouldn't want to do the noise reduction on the D4 that I did on a, a D whatever, 70. So in that situation I was using it, but now not so much. I, I have uh, now I think four cameras that I'm using, um, so it's pretty similar. Can I show something for noise real quick? Yeah. All right. So one of the things that I think people miss a lot is really looking carefully at their noise. And so I just wanted to point out that use that details window. You can click the target on, on your subject so you can really see what's happening. And that's going to help you as you go in. And, and then, of course, you know, don't be afraid to, to zoom in. You know, if you are going to be working, you want to really get to that 100% view. Or even you know, that's really going to make a difference as you're working with that. 
and you know, back off the clarity ahead of time, start to drag those. If you hold down the option or alt key as you drag, you see there how you get the edge detail, like the black and white preview? It makes it a lot easier to see the radius and the amount. So it basically dragging the amount slider with the option or alt key switches to a black and white image, which makes it easier to see the amount of sharpening. And then option or alt dragging the radius slider gives you a mask to sort of show you what you're doing. Same thing with detail there, so you can decide how much to preserve. And I find that really useful as I work, so I can dial in just the right amount. Just use that modifier key, and again, you don't have to do as much guesswork, plus the distraction of colors removed. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Somebody asked about uh, how and where to make a basic logo and watermark. There's not enough time to go into that, but you basically need to have a, um, a transparent PNG file. That, that works best for watermarks. Um, and I think, Gavin, have you made a video on Adorama TV on doing watermarks in uh, Lightroom? Uh, no, I haven't, no. Um, I did um, a video on how to do watermarks in Photoshop Elements, bizarrely enough, but I've never done one in, in Lightroom, so maybe that's something we can look at for... Uh, future yeah. Adorama episodes. You, you'll I'm need Photoshop <laughs> or, or even PowerPoint, but basically yeah. Photoshop file safe for web will do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then on export, there's a place that you can create a preset watermark, and then you can, yeah. Uh, it's very, very simple, but in five minutes, there's not enough time to show, um, unless somebody can in five minutes. Uh, James, thank you for watching. Uh, let's see. James is saying thank you. That sounded like a challenge, stuff. Mark, so I'm going to see if I can find the file and do it in two. <laughs> yeah, I, like I have some, yeah, I don't have Actually, a lot of I can, hey, I, can, I can do it. I got it. So All right. Let me Go open ahead. it up. Keep, answer one more question, and I'll do it, I'll do it very fast. Okay. Uh, oh, we're getting official. Mark says that Facebook says 2048 or 960 pixels on the long edge. Yeah, and I, I remember reading that somewhere. So ultimately, oh. Facebook is going 2000 and whatever it is. So uh, I, yeah. I did try. I tried a, an experiment uploading at both sizes, and at the moment, I couldn't see any difference because if you do any other size, then Facebook resizes it for you. Um, but maybe that's the future. Perhaps that's how they're going to go. And that kind of makes sense for high resolution because things are getting higher resolution. I got yeah, it open yeah. if you guys want to see real time. Hey, that's good. All right. All right. Let's see it. Can you see my signature? Yeah. There it uh, is. So nice. You could scan it. You could draw it with your tablet. You could take a picture of it. doesn't really matter. Run a levels adjustment so the blacks are blacks and the whites are whites, so it's really high contrast. And then basically under channels, you can command or control click to load that. So I'll usually make it white on black, load that so it's active, and then just make a new layer and say edit, fill, and fill that with white. And then because you don't know if you're putting it over a light photo or a dark photo, I'll usually add just a really small thin stroke, like four pixels of a black stroke, so there's a contrasting edge. That's often called type one pattern. And then you just say File, Save for Web, and save that as a PNG 24 with the transparency checked. Then you got it. Let's just put that out to the desktop where all files go. And then uh, back in Lightroom, when you make your uh, export presets there, you can go in, File, Export with Presets, and basically we can add that as one of the uh, presets, and of course I'm forgetting where the preset manager is. Let me find that. Cancel. File. Export. There it is. And so you can add a preset there. Watermark. And then you can go in and you can basically turn that on right there as a watermark and just say edit watermarks. Grab the image that you want. There we go. Choose. And then you basically adjust the size. See, it's down there in the corner. And so I could adjust the size, and I could inset it a little bit. Or you could just basically, there we go, put that where you want and anchor it to any of the corners as you see fit. And then that's part of the export, and you could put that over multiple images. Yeah, and the nice thing is with uh, watermarks is they scale to the size of your image. 
mm. um, which is fantastic, and um, and they're proportional. You can make them proportional, which is yeah. Cool. That's what's cool there, like twenty percent so, of the image size. So yeah. you don't have to be like that guy. So you can right. be more like that, the subtle, tasteful one. So that's cool. Was that fast enough? That yeah, was that impressively was really fast. quick. That was amazing. I, yeah, well done. So Gavin, let's do this. I'm going to do one since Rich already did one. I'll do one for uh, Adorama TV on how to do it using um, vector files. And then you can show how to do it with uh, something else, and then we'll all do our own version of how to do watermarks. <laughs> That'd be a great week, week on Adorama so. TV, wouldn't it? I know. <laughs> and then I challenge you guys episode. to do it while wearing a raincoat. Just have a theme. <laughs> okay, yeah, that'll work. Do you guys uh, have any final words? Forty-two. I think this was a blast. We should do it again. Absolutely. This is yeah. probably my favorite ever Google Hangout that I've ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was your first, but, but Gavin, we're glad that we could join you for it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mark, as always, great to work with you. Enjoyed your stuff. Yeah. Same to you, Gavin. It's always fun to hang out. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you.